Okay, it's 8 o'clock. Uh, class is not full, but let's just get started. I guess uh, a lot of people have come to rely on technology, but uh, we're just finding out technology can let us down. <laughs> so, I assigned uh, the projects to most people uh, who had sent me email over the last week or so. And there are still that uh, few that are missing. I don't know whether you are still registered in the class or not. I have sent you also email. If you are registered, want to do it for credit, you should send me uh, your preferred projects. There are still a lot of projects that are available because uh, many people have gone after uh, the same project. Mm -hmm. The cylinder, flow pass cylinder has been very popular, four requests. <laughs> but I said there is enough in the literature. It's a very well studied problem that four people can focus on four different aspects. So I have assigned specifically one circular cylinder, one square cylinder, and the other two, two circular cylinders and two square cylinders. <laughs> so it's your job to find the paper with those specifications. There are a lot of parameters that you can play with. Um, so we need to come up, Munal and I will suggest a tentative schedule for you. That is, maybe in two weeks, finish the literature search and print produce a progress report so that we know that you are progressing in the right direction. Those will not be assessed. And then uh, maybe problem formulation in about three to four weeks' time. We have exactly two months from now till first week of May. And uh, we will schedule the presentations and make the project reports due in the first week of May so that uh, we can do the assessment based on that. So if you are registered in the course and you haven't sent me the list, uh, you would have received an email this morning. And please send me your project uh, request. Are there any questions or? <coughs> I just want to check. What happened to the guys from Petroleum Institute? Is there a technical problem on that side? I don't know. Just give me one minute. I'll just shoot an email and see whether there is an email from them as well. It's a holiday for them, I'm not sure. But nobody told me anything about it. Okay, so maybe others will trickle in. Uh, so what we did in the last lecture was to look at in great detail and through an example of how we set up Newton method and the oil Newton continuation. And today we are going to look at the implementation of arc length continuation. And uh, I may end up again taking the whole lecture today uh, because I want to complete this example all the way to tracking the limit points so developing the theory as well as showing how it is, it is implemented in MATLAB. Uh, if I finish early, I guess then Renal will show the implementation of similar ideas in COMSOL. If not, he will do it on Monday. Monday I'm also traveling, so I'll be back by Wednesday lecture, but Monday lecture will be given by Renal under any circumstances because I'm not here. Okay. Um, so in this particular problem, the problem uh, was uh, Uh, a CSTR, a non-isothermal CSTR, uh, uh, these two equations, the steady state equations. And it is a highly nonlinear problem, and it has a fairly complex dynamics and stability considerations. The two unknowns are A and T, and there are a lot of parameters. But we are going to look at Q as a distinguished parameter 
in which as we change the flow rate to the reactor, the steady state abruptly changes. And we saw in the last uh, lecture, uh, in the previous lecture, the theory behind how to implement continuation methods, and last class actually implemented it in MATLAB. And uh, the picture looks like this. If you plot the state variable A or T against the control variable Q, the picture looks something like this. Okay. Um, but what we have been able to do with the simple continuation is only the part that goes like this, and then the solution jumps and continues on like that. And then when you start with this one and continue back the oil and neutron continuation, we saw that it will continue like this and then jump back. So from this uh, oil and neutron implementation, we know that there is a jump across these two points. So there are limit points. Limit points are points where the solution turns on itself with respect to that parameter. And the eigenvalue of that system goes through 0. So the stability actually changes. If this is a stable system, that will become an unstable system. Again, another limit point will make that as a stable system. So in reality, you will be able to re realize both the upper and the lower branch. But the intermediate branch, you will not be able to realize in an experiment because it is an unstable system. And we can actually test that by calculating the eigenvalues of this 2 by 2 matrix. Okay. So before I continue with the arc length, I want to make sure if there are any questions. Have you had a chance to look at the code? I put all the MATLAB file in Modal. And I have also assigned you a next assignment where, where you will work through the same algorithms but on the Bratou problem with a similar exponential nonlinearity with a similar uh, solution structure with an S-shaped uh, solution profile. No questions? How about people NPI? I saw only one person so far. So those guys online, are you guys okay with the last lecture? Any questions on that? <coughs> OK. Uh, if, if you do, maybe send me an email. If you are uh, taking this only from online, particularly <coughs> distant people at the Petroleum Institute, if you want to schedule a certain time where we can chat over the same system. but. Uh, uh, we will figure out maybe use a phone or something to go with Adobe Connect uh, so that we can have a voice conversation. Okay, because I, I want to make sure that you guys are also able to have the same access to me in terms of questions and doubts. Okay, so we saw what an arc length method is. The basic idea is if I have two equations, two functions, f1 and f2, that you see here, with two unknowns. But q as a parameter, then I get into this problem of not having a solution past a certain critical value in q. So why not make q itself as an unknown, as we did here, extend our system to capital X, as I indicated here, which is the lowercase vector x, which contains two elements a and t, plus q as an unknown. So all these are unknowns. Okay. And so I get an extra degree of freedom because I have an extra unknown. And that degree of freedom, I choose to define a new equation, which is a measure of the length measured along the arc of the solution. Okay. So and that equation, as I said, there are a number of ways of defining that arc length constraint. And one of them that I'm going to illustrate today, the other one that I showed you in the previous lectures is a quadratic equation, which has actually a measure of the Pythagorean distance. Um, uh, but here it is uh, a kind of a tangent plane kind of a constraint, where I write that equation as w1 times dA ds. S is my new parameter, reparameterized problem. Arc length is my new parameter, multiplied by a minus a naught plus w2 dt ds t minus t naught plus dq ds because q is now an unknown. I'm tracking in this how each one of those variables a, t, and q are changing as I change a new parameter s. Okay? And that is equal to s minus s naught, which is a known controllable parameter. Now I put that as an input. Okay? So 
uh, <coughs> I need to choose what this W1, the weighting function is, W2 is. And the reason I have put only W1 and W2 here is because I know in this problem A is much lower in magnitude than T is and I want to bring both of them to the same level. Otherwise, when I'm adding these numbers, this number turns out to be very small. The impact of changes in A on the arc length is going to be very small. Question. Where are we evaluating those derivatives? On? That's a good question. I think uh, Miran asked me the same question. How do I get those derivatives? Not so much how, but I mean, you've got it evaluated at a particular point. That is at the current current location. So in order to, before I can start the arc length continuation, just like before I started Euler Newton continuation, I need to get a solution with the Newton method. Okay. The first reference point is where I make some arbitrary guess and I solve the Newton method. And uh, maybe you can see that in the MATLAB code. I think we should run this in parallel because we want to know how to structure the MATLAB code. So the question was, uh, where, where is this derivative dA, dS, dT, dS, dQ, dS, where are they evaluated and how do we get that? And that's what I'm going to address first. Because in defining this equation, I should know all those numbers, okay? <coughs> so this is the script that we have been writing and uh, developing further on. So in lines one to four is where we solve the basic problem just two nonlinear algebraic equations using the Newton method. So line four, I get the solution vector x, which is containing two elements, a and t. That's a converged solution. And that is where I would have to evaluate that particular derivative, okay? We, and in the next uh, two sections, two cells, from uh, five to 13, I guess, uh, and then 14 to 22, they are implementation of the Euler-Newton continuation, okay? So in, in that we will see uh, how, we already saw how to evaluate the A, D, Q, and D, T, D, Q. Q is the parameter, and how does uh, Q changes in Q, how, how do they affect the changes in A and T? So the derivative of, uh, uh, let me open that up. Okay, so here you see in line uh, 10, dx dq vector is calculated, okay? And that vector will contain dA dq and dt dq, okay? Um, so what we want to do now is calculate the derivatives with respect to s because we've reparameterized the problem. What we have here is a derivative with respect to q, but we need to get the derivatives with respect to s, okay? So let's go and see how we would do that. So in this equation, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to take the derivative of n with respect to s, dn ds, okay? And uh, remember, the only variable in n equation is this a, this t, and this q. a naught, t naught, q naught are current reference points. And w1, w2 are weight fi factors which are constants again. And similarly, the dA, dS, dT, dS, dQ, dS are the slopes at the current location. They are also constants in that equation, okay? So when you're taking the derivative of this, what you will get is W1 dA, dS multiplied by another dA, dS here, okay? And then A naught will be zero. W2 dT, dS, and then the derivative from the second time I mean the temperature, which will be dT dS, okay, plus dQ dS multiplied by, again, another dQ dS. Uh, and then dS with respect to dS would be 1, right? So let me take this to the left hand, or, or let me leave it like that, 1, okay? So that is simply taking the derivative of the new equation that I have defined for n with respect to s. My goal is to estimate these derivatives at the current reference point, okay? So now I notice that these are simply squared, so I can write this as uh, W1 dA dQ squared dQ dS squared, 
what have I done? I have used the chain rule to write DA DS as DA DQ times DQ DS in both the terms. Okay? So I get DA DQ square multiplied by DQ DS square plus W2 DT DQ square multiplied by DQ DS square plus I have DQ DS square equal to 1. Okay? So now I can factor out the DQ DS from this and write it as DQ DS is equal to 1 divided by square root of W1 DA DQ square plus W2 DT DQ square plus 1. You understand the manipulation? Okay. So, but I already know what DA DQ and DQ, DT DQ are. How do I know that? I just did it from the Euler Newton continuation, right? So you solve the Newton method, you apply the Euler Newton uh, to calculate the derivatives, and so you know those derivatives. So everything on the right hand side of this is known. So you can calculate what DQ DS is. Okay? And once you know DQ DS, you just take DA DQ multiplied by DQ DS, that's going to give you DA DQ multiplied by DQ DS is going to give you DA DS. Similarly for the DT DS also. Okay? So this is how you would get this number and put it in there. So you would use this first all on the right hand side is known. So calculate DQDS and then use the DQDS in here and calculate DADS and then use the DADS in there. The same thing applies for DTDS because you know DTDQ multiplied by DQDS and you can calculate DTDS. So now you know all the parameters. So I'm going to estimate all these parameters or determine all these parameters and then pass it on to the arc length scheme. Okay? And the arc length scheme then is essentially solving three equations in three unknowns by specifying S as the parameter. Yeah. Why, why the other invariances were Pardon I me? Mean, this should be a square, right, in, in the variance, in the arc, arc lengths. Uh, there are two, I mean, uh, you are right. What I showed you in the very first lecture was where I defined N as W1 times A minus A naught square plus W2 times T minus T naught square. That's another vari uh, variation which doesn't require you to estimate this DTDS and DQDS. Okay? So this one requires you to calculate these derivatives. If you take the derivative of that first equation, you will get this equation. Uh, yeah, it is like tangent uh, yeah. derivative of that I is the slope. You, you would get. The idea is the same, but representation is different. Yeah, and there are many other suggestions for <laughs> what this arc length equation constraint might be. Essentially, what you are doing is you are reparameterizing it, so you have an equation that you can write in any way that you want. In fact, Murnau came up with some idea of how to even simplify this depending on which is large in magnitude. I think we talked about it yesterday. Yeah. So there is a lot of freedom and for creativity in coming up with alternate specifications for that arc length equation. So the quadratic one is one I showed, but I, I didn't implement that. I've implemented this one. So in the program, I'm going to show you how to do this one. So keep all these equations in mind because now I'm going to go to the MATLAB version and show you how we implement these things on the same problem. Okay. <coughs> so here is my driver and uh, the, the script and the arc length scheme uh, is at the very bottom. just one function that I'm making a call and I'm putting the plot there. So let's just run it maybe and then see, run it up to that point. That's the Euler Newton, forward and backward. Figure 2 is the arc length one. Okay. You, you see that it's went back all the way and then uh, the same thing, the temperature. 
Okay? So that's what ArcLink is able to do, trace the entire path with S as the parameter. Now, as I am solving this, I am plotting the data point. Every time I give a new delta S, I solve it. And can you see something um, with that information that I've given you? Every data point that is calculated is plotted here. Okay? So are, are all the data points equally spaced? What you'd see is that in certain sections, it takes a larger delta S. Whereas as it turns around, the curvature is tight, it takes a smaller delta S. That's a strategy that we have not talked about, but I have implemented in the code, which is essentially to adjust the step size delta S. You can do it with a constant delta S, but if you do it with a constant delta S, what would happen is the Newton method will require a varying number of iterations, because sometimes it's a good guess, sometimes it's not a good guess. Okay? Whereas you can say, I want always the solution to be obtained in about three Newton iterations or four Newton iterations. Then how do I adjust? So if the current iteration took five iterations, I would say, okay, take the ratio of four to five and cut down my delta S so that hopefully in the next one, it will take four. In the next one, it still took five. I will say, okay, in the next one, I'm going to cut it even further down, okay? This idea is called the automatic step length adjustment and it is used in ordinary differential equations. We will see that later on, okay? But the same idea can be implemented in the arc length scheme, and that is why you see the points as not being equally spaced, because it's adjusting the delta S automatically. And I will show you where it is uh, doing that, okay? So the arc length scheme basically is able to turn, and you can continue this forever, okay? If there are other turning points, it will get them. Uh, what would happen, for example, if I had a solution path that looks something like this? In this particular problem, it doesn't occur, but it may occur in other problems. You have a branch like this, okay? So if I continue uh, from arc length, it's going to turn around without any problem around these. <coughs> what will it do here? If I you, pardon me? No, 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 the Newton method will converge to one of those three solutions. All of a sudden, now I have a possibility of three solutions for the same value of delta S. I'm not specifying delta Q anymore. Delta Q is an unknown still, okay? So I'm somewhere here, and I'm saying, find me a solution, what happened? Find me a solution at a certain delta S from that point, okay? So it could be a solution at this distance, at this distance, or at this distance. Now, if I give the tangent vector, if I calculate the tangent vector with respect to d a d s, d t d s, and d q d s, which I have already calculated, right? If I use that tangent vector and project, then the initial guess is going to be most likely close to this. So it will just continue on without even knowing, without even being aware that there is a branch that is cutting in. Okay? But what would happen from stability theory, we know that the stability will change. This, this is stable, that's going to become unstable. And the stability is transferred through that. So if you monitor your eigenvalues as you're going along, you will see a change in the eigenvalue, sign of the eigenvalue. That's a detection, that's an indication that there is some other solution. If it is not a turning point, maybe it is a pitchfork bifurcation. There are other type of bifurcations as well, a solution that looks <coughs> like this, another solution that intersects. It's called the transcritical bifurcation point. So a lot of see, such behavior are possible, and the arc length essentially will give you the solution that are continuing along the tangent line without being aware of what exists uh, surrounding it, okay? So let's look at the function itself. So the transfer is at this stage. So get two is open, and the transfer is controlled to CSDR arc, and 300 is the number of steps I wanted it to take. Okay, so current <coughs> step, do it 300 times. Take 300 steps and go as far as you can, okay? So that is the only input parameter to that particular function, CSTR, R. So how does that look? Where is that function? It's somewhat of a long program because it has certain st automatic step length uh, uh, adjustment schemes, but you can see the first part up to line 15 is, 14 is essentially initializing all the parameters, 
and then in 15, I'm in initializing the guess because I've not passed any guess anything to this. I've just passed the number of steps that it needs to do. So inside the arc length, I say roughly the initial concentration is 0 0.0005 and the temperature is 310 and that is a vector x. <coughs> and then I take x1 and put it into a. These are all just cut and paste from other programs. And initially, I set q as equal to 1. So I'm going to start from q equal to 1 and continue. And I'm initializing the count so that I know how many steps I have taken. So i equal to 1, fairly easy to do. And remember, well, as I said, I need to solve by the Newton method once to get the solution. Okay? So that is only an initial guess in line 15. So line 19 makes a call to the Newton method using that as an initial guess. There is no continuation here, just a straightforward Newton method with some initial guess for a two by two system. So I'm using the CSTR F and CSTR J that I wrote earlier, reusing that. Okay? And once I get the solution, I start accumulating the solution. So SOLN dot Q stores, it's a structure that's going to store all the Q values. The Q now becomes an unknown, remember, after this step. And then uh, SOLN dot X is a structure that saves all the solution vectors. Okay? Uh, and uh, I calculate the DX DQ. Again, this is something that we have done before. Okay, the derivative of A with respect to Q and T with respect to Q by simply making a call to this uh, CSTR DFDQ. That provides me with the reference value, the X naught, the A naught, and the T naught in the arc length equation. So do you remember that? I need to kind of switch back and forth. So what I'm doing now is trying to estimate um, this and this as well as the derivatives that I need, <coughs> DA, DQ, and DT, DQ. I have figured out these parts in the code. And please do stop me if the code is uh, not clear. Uh, for the guys in uh, Petroleum Institute or outside, the board is not working today. It's not calibrated, so I'm trying to write from my laptop itself. So I'm not uh, uh, doing it as good a job probably, OK? Uh, so in this particular section, I have calculated the current solution and I'm putting it into the reference solution and I'm calculating the dx dq vector, which actually is a two vector of like two with dA dq and dt dq. And then I'm uh, defining what the weighting factor is. W1 is 10, W2 is 0 0.01. The reason is A is a very small number. I want to boost it up. And t is a large number. I want to scale it down. Okay, and that's purely arbitrary. You can ask me, how did you come up with 10 and 0 0.01? You can come up with anything else, 15 and point. So you play with it. So the arc length parameters are something that you have to play with to make sure that it gives you uh, good stepping, etc. Et because it's a measure of the length, and we need to define that measure. Okay, and then delta s, the initial step size, I'm saying is 0.2 in the new variable, okay? That is S minus S naught. In the equation, on the right hand side, I have S minus S naught, and that is what I call as del S in the program. And I've set it initially to 0.2, okay? So, so far I have obtained a DA, DQ, DT, DQ, and I've set W1 and W2, okay? And I'm calculating in the next step dqds. This is the equation that we wrote <coughs> this morning. Okay, dqds is one over square root of one plus w1 dx dq squared plus dx dq two squared. Okay, that's exactly the equation that we wrote, derived just this morning to calculate dqds. And once I know dqds, I said I can calculate dxds in terms of dx dq multiplied by dqds. Let me ask you. What am I doing in line 26? What would be the character of each variable? Is it a scalar, vector, matrix? Just to get you thinking and keep your attention. It, dx, ds would be a vector of length 2. And that, that is because dx dq is a vector of length 2. But dq ds is a scalar number. Okay, So that scalar number multiplies every element in the vector in the MATLAB context. And then I project a next guess. So in line 27, I say x is equal to x plus 
dx ds times delta s. So that is going to give me a new initial starting guess from the current converged solution with the tangent projection. Same idea that we applied in Euler Newton continuation. Okay, and uh, uh, it does it only for the first two variables a and t because x has only length two. That's why I need to do x three explicitly. Now is the time I'm really expanding the equations to vector length to three. Okay, so I'm defining x three for the first time, and I'm saying x three is the current value of q plus dq ds multiplied by delta s. That will be the delta q. That will be the increment, right? Do you understand that part? I'm talking about this particular line. Okay. So now I have a projected initial guess <coughs> for the Newton method for the expanded set of three equations. Okay. And I have defined all the parameters I need in the arc length scheme, so I'm going to gather them all up. So I define a new variable called arc p, which is the arc length parameters, and it is of length 9, okay, in lines 30 and 31. And what does it have? It has the weighting function in a certain way I'm packing it, so that I can use it in other programs. Where would I need it? I would need it in the function evaluation, because I'm going to use Newton method to solve these three equations. So I'm going to make a call to the Newton method. Newton method will make a call to the function and the Jacobian for the 3 by 3 system. I still need to construct that. Okay? So in there I will need all these parameters because the third function is going to need what w1 is, w2 is, what dx, ds is, etc. They are all calculated only in this function but I need a mechanism to transfer them. You can use global to transfer it but I'm, uh, I'm not really sure what I did it but we will see what I did. So I'm right, right now just packing all the variables that I need that appear in the arc length equation, the definition of the arc length equation. And then I said j max equal to 4. This is for controlling the step size automatically. So I'm saying the maximum number of I, in Newton iterations I would like to have is 4. So if certain length is too large and it takes 6, equation, six iterations, then cut it to a shorter length so that in the next time it will do it in 4. So my target for Newton iteration is 4. Question? Is that setting the maximum number of new iterations? I guess part of me thinks that is that always, is it always faster or does it hit four and then change the step size and go back and then take two more iterations? So technically it's had six iterations at a one step size and then another step size as opposed to something like, or, or does, it, does it take as many iterations as it needs and yes, yes. The way I have implemented it is once I give it an initial guess and a next parameter value, I pass control to Newton. And you take as many iterations as you need to converge. But report to me how many iterations you took so that the next time I will send you an easier job. I will take you a shorter delta S. Because right? I want you to do the hit the target of about four. So it's not, okay. it's not that each time Newton runs, it's going to only take four iterations and then no, no, no. Just uh, I, I am aiming that as a target, but I am letting Newton take as many iterations as it needs. So if it, if it reports three to me, saying that I converged in three iterations, next time I will increase the delta S directly in proportion to this four and the number of actual number of iterations that it took. Okay. Now the other problem that I need to face is I send a delta S and around the turning point. I've set within the Newton iterations 25 maximum iterations and then you quit. Okay, right. So it can, can tries to iterate for 25 iterations and it fails. It does not converge. What do we do then? I want it to report that also to me because if it failed, what, what options do I have? I can go back to the previous result and then say take half the step size as you did before when you failed and see whether you can converge it with half the step size. And if you fail again, I'll say half it again, right? But when you do that, you have the potential to set up an infinite loop, right? So I monitor how many times it fails. If it fails 10 times successively, I say I give up and take the control over. So it'll print out a message saying fail 10 successive failures and I quit, okay? So these are the bells and whistles that you can put in uh, to make it, I guess, as general as possible. And it's a very clumsy program. I'm not a very good programmer like Richard. 
in our group. So, but I still put this on so that you can use that in your own problem because a lot of this you could be, you could use it because I modularize it in such a way. All you would need to do is provide the CSTR F, the CSTR J, its replacements for BRA2 F, BRA2 J. You write those functions, and you should be able to adapt what I have <coughs> to, be able to solve for your problem. And that's why it's important for you to understand what is happening here. Hopefully, it helps translate abstract ideas into con concrete realization as well. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then start, starts the big loop, which is going to do from step two to n steps. Why did I start with two? I already did one step with the Newton method. Okay. So from two to total number of steps. So I'm preparing my code for eventual failure. So I take x and save it into a vector called x save. Now x is an extended variable. There are three unknowns in there. Okay. But I have the current solution and I'm saving it. In case it fails, I need to come back and restart it from that. Right. So I'm saving it. And uh, I put a flag to say whether I, I fail is true or false. Initially it is false. And j equal to 0, I'm setting that counter for the automatic step size. Then while j is less than j max, j is equal to j plus 1, this is the next key part. In line 37, I am calling CSTR f arc. Okay, so this is an, another function I wrote. Its purpose is to take the vector x, which is now going to contain three elements, and all the parameters arc p, the weighting factors, the derivatives, etc. they're all passed in there. Okay. The purpose of that function is to calculate for me f1, f2, and n, the three functions. Okay. Then I make a call to CSTR j arc, the Jacobian for the arc link system. So that will return to me what? A matrix of, Jacobian matrix of what size? Three by three. three, by three right? And so you need to look at that to calculate what the derivatives, how the derivatives are calculated. And then you have the Newton method itself, x equals x minus j inverse f and uh, if the norm is 10 to the minus 9 that means it's converged then I take the solution vector the third component and put it into SOL and Q and take the first two elements and put it into SOL and X so I have a structure for solution SOLN uh, X will contain the solution A and T and uh, Q will contain the solution and what am I doing in line 42 can you guess checking the sign of the eigenvalue. So that is a lot of nested programs inside the function. So you need to start with CSTRJ. CSTRJ takes the solution vector and the parameter. They are stored in 1 to 2 and then 3. Okay. So that will return the eigenvalues. And then I am taking the real part of the eigenvalues because the eigenvalues can be complex. So I am taking the real part. And I'm flipping the sign. Why am I flipping the sign? When, when I'm going around an arc length, there is exactly one eigenvalue that is going to go from the negative to the positive side. So imagine that I have 100 equations. I'll have a 100 by 100 eigenvalue. I will have 100 eigenvalues. They will all be on the left side of the complex plane if the system is stable. And there will be only one that will go to the right hand side, escape to the right hand side. Okay, so. If I flip all of the signs, then everyone, everything should be positive and only one will go to the negative. And so when I take the product of all of them, I'll get a negative sign. So it's just a logic for figuring out whether I'm crossing that. So I'm flipping the sign and then I'm taking the product and I'm determining what the sign of that is, whether it's positive or negative. So it's going to do for every solution along the entire arc length, okay? Because as soon as I have the solution, I pass the solution to the Jacobian. Take the Jacobian eigenvalues of the Jacobian are the ones that determine the stability. So the Jacobian is so important. It allows you to project the tangent vector. It allows you to get the solution in the Newton method with quadratic convergence. It also allows you to determine the stability of the solution. Okay. And then what am I doing in line 43? Yeah, loaded. 
Why am I inverting the Jacobian? What am I trying to achieve in that line? If you understand this part, I'm confident that you, I, I will feel confident that you have understood everything that we have talked about. Because I have not explicitly talked about this up to this point, but we have used this idea before. What is the idea? The idea is to get the tangent vector for projection for the next solution. This is the Euler-Newton continuation. In the two by two system, the Euler-Newton continuation basically said that I have the Jacobian multiplied by df dq. Q was the continuation parameter, right? Here S is the continuation parameter. So I need to take the derivative of DF with respect to DS. Now what is DF1 with respect to DS? The first equation does not have S at all. That's why it is 0. The second equation also does not have S at all. That's why it is 0. So the key for you to understand is this, what is this vector? That vector is DF DS, okay? The third equation has S on the <coughs> right hand side as S minus S naught. So df ds would be minus 1. You have to take that as minus equal to 0. Remember, n is equal to 0 is how you must write. Maybe let's go back to this equation. So I'm talking about uh, dn ds calculated from this. After you write it as n is equal to 0, that means left hand side minus right hand side equal to 0. Okay, then when you take the derivative of this with respect to s, you're going to get minus 1. Okay, so it's so easy to calculate the tangent vector after you've done all the other work. Just one line gives you uh, the derivative. Is that clear? Okay, so I have Euler Newton continuation on the extended system of three equations in line 43. Okay, and in line 44, what am I doing? Adjusting the step line. Okay, so the new del S is going to be the previous del S multiplied by J max over J. Okay, where did I get J? Yeah, I'm counting the number of iterations. Last. I think there is a prop, prop bug in the code there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So every time it goes through this iteration, it increments J. So the actual number of iterations is counted in J. Okay. So if the actual number of iterations is the same as maximum iterations, that means you are okay. Previous delta S and the next delta S will be the same. But if the actual number of iterations turns out to be 6, then it will be reduced, the next delta S. Yeah? Going back to line 43. 43? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm still stuck on the kind of the idea of re-parameterizing the problem. But couldn't you figure out, I guess, an ideal third equation based on just calculations from that line? Because if you had, yeah. if you had like a circle uh, instead of the plane, you would have zero, zero, negative two. Right? Yeah, yeah, to to s, negative two s. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So do, do you get any other insight out of that line? You, 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 no, no, no. There is no. There is no. Calculation. There is no insight to be gained by that, but there needs to be an understanding why we are doing it. We are doing it, maybe let me go back and uh, try to explain that uh, better. Okay, so in the original case, if I had A versus Q, okay, this is the solution vector. Right. And if I have a converged solution at that point, I want to project that. So I want to calculate what DA DQ is, okay? and that's all the Newton continuation. Now what I have done is I have re-parameterized <coughs> the problem. 
So when I plot A versus S, I'm not going to get that solution. How would the solution look like? In fact, something that we talked about in the last, the last class, it may go up and down, but it will be unique. Okay. There is no fold like that because S is a distance measured along that and that continuously increases. Right? So I'm still what I'm still doing is calculating that tangent vector d a d s. Okay, so conceptually there is really no additional insight. If you understood what we are doing there, we are doing exactly <coughs> the same thing on an extended set of equations. Previously we did it with two equations, now I'm doing it with three equations. I'm calculating the derivative of all the three variables, a, t, and q, with respect to the new parameter s. Previously, I did it only with a and t with respect to q. Okay. Is that clear? Or yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. It turns out that the right hand side of that particular, uh, in here, we had dx dq as minus j inverse df dq. F was the two equations, and both of them had q in it. So when we took the derivative, it's a little bit more complicated right. expression. Right. But now what we are doing is we have this dx ds. The extended vector s is equal to minus j inverse df, uh, I guess I should call it j, ds. Okay, so this f now is three equations, including the third equation. But the first two equations do not have s in it. And that's why it, it's a simpler vector compared to that vector. Okay? And this would be a more complicated uh, Jacobian compared to that. And we will see what the Jacobian looks like, what the function looks like. Okay? So in... Uh, Line 43, we calculated the tangent vector projection. Line 44, we adjust the step size. What am I doing in line 45 to 47? <coughs> I am updating all the arc length parameters because I have a now a new value for dx dx. Right? I'm storing it in arc p because I need to pass this back in here. Arc p is the vector I'm passing to the function and the Jacobian. And they need the current reference point and the tangent at the current reference point. I've just calculated the current, the tangent at the current subject point. So I'm packing them in the right order. And uh, what am I doing in line 46? Can you explain that to me? Okay. Yeah? You are reading. You are not telling me what. what <laughs> anybody can read the program, right? But what is that x vector? It is not the solution. It becomes a new reference point. A current converged result becomes a new reference point. Okay. That's why it is going into seven nine positions. If you look there, so arc p the positions in seven and nine contains the reference values, and so the current solution becomes a new reference value. Okay. And the tangent vectors go into 3 to 5. And uh, the delta s, of course, goes into the sixth position. Okay. So here I have defined what the positions are, the meaning of each position in the vector that I'm packing, which I'm sending to CSTR, FR, and JR. I'll open that up and show you. But I just want you to understand the flow of the arc length uh, uh, program logic. So updating the new initial guess, x equal to x plus dx ds times delta s. And uh, uh, I'm storing the solution for dx ds uh, also in the solution vector. And uh, if this condition is true, that is less than this, it's going to go through this Newton iteration. If it is converged, then it's going to break out. Okay, And then it, it will check. If I fail continuously 10 times, I want to quit. So the error will actually take control back into the desktop. <coughs> so 10 successive failures. So I'm keeping track of the number of failures. And that is done here. Okay? If j is greater than j max, then half the step size. Okay? Delta s is equal to delta s over 2. But I need to 
retrieve the previously saved solution vector, restore them, and then send it back so that I can restart from the previously converged result because I took two large step size, Newton method failed, so I need to take half the step size. So that is the essential flow. And once this is completed, I get all the solution and I can plot that. Q against uh, the first vector A, first element of the vector, or Q against the second element of the vector. Okay? That is the one that generates the graph that you saw. Okay? So the, the last thing that remain, remains to be understood, I guess, is how do I construct these two functions, uh, CSDR uh, F and J for the arc length scheme. And with that, you should be able to do your current assignment. Okay. So this function is not really very difficult to understand because we have already written this function, except I'm making a change to pass all the arc length parameters. And from the arc length parameters, I am unloading all the variables so that I can use them directly as W1 in the equation. So the first two equations you already have. So I just copied the CSTRF function. I changed its name to CSTRF arc. And I added the arc t parameter. And I added the third line in line 21. That is the definition for the arc length equation n. OK? So here I have the x reference. I have the dx ds. Everything is as you would see, except the left hand side minus right hand side equal to 0. So the del s comes from the left hand side here, minus del s. Okay, any questions on that? This is not as difficult. The, even the next one for J is not as difficult. What is it there? Okay, so this is the Jacobian for the extended 3 by 3 system, and it also needs all the arc length parameters which have been. Uh, imported into this. And line 19 to 22, we already wrote okay, the derivatives of the 2 by 2 part of the matrix. Now we need to assemble the 3 by 3 part of the matrix. Okay? So let's maybe talk about how would the 3 by 3 matrix look like. Okay? So the extended Jacobian, what are the elements that will go in here? DF1, DA, DF1, D, T, and then DF1, D, Q. Okay. Similarly, df2, da, df2, dt, df2, dq. And the last one is dn, da, dn, dt, and dn, dq. Now, of this, we already calculated these previously, okay, the 2 by 2. How about this one? We also calculated that, right, to calculate the tangent vector projection, df dq. That's what this vector is. <coughs> so the only two new elements that you need to calculate are the three elements on the bottom row. Okay, and uh, you can see that. Uh, so what I do here is simply make a call to the function that I already wrote, CSTR df dq, which calculates the the call the last column. Okay, the two elements in the last column. So I put them into 1, 3, and 2, 3. And then the last row, if you take the derivative of that with respect to uh, A, it's going to be simply W1 times dx ds. Okay? And J32 will be W times dx ds again for the, uh, I mean, dt ds. And J33 is simply dq ds. Okay? So it's really not very difficult to do once you understand this idea and it's an important <coughs> idea because I'm going to show you the next difficult problem to solve. The problem is how do I know exactly where the turning point is? Okay, what this method does is it just turns around. So approximately by looking at the figure, we can say that the limit point is, uh, uh, for example, somewhere around 10 and another one is somewhere around 7. But if I want to exactly calculate where that is and more importantly, once I calculate that, I want to see how is that affected by changing the ambient temperature, the cooling water temperature, or any other parameter, because there are 10 other parameters in the problem, right? So how, how do these limit points <coughs> change as I change other control things that I have in the reactor, cooling water, etc. Question? I understand why we adjusted 
our plan stepping is taking large steps in that, uh, if I'm looking at the green yeah. graph, yeah. in that range of four to eight. Uh, and I understand why it's further resolving itself in the region of like seven to 10. Yeah. But why is it taking fine steps after 10? Good, good question. Is that just a... Um. It, I, I think it depends on uh, the rate of change of the variable. And these, what you are saying is, by looking at these figures, dt, dq, and da, dq are small. Right. So why can't it take a larger step size? Right. And uh, you can see that it is beginning to take here, okay. right? But it is taking that long. Maybe it constrained the step size going around it so much. And every time, it can it take only expand by only a certain ratio. Okay. So by tuning this parameter 4 to 5 or 6, yeah. you will be able to change those things. Okay. okay. So in the automatic step size, basically J max is your parameter that you can manipulate. <coughs> and you will see by manipulating that you can probably get the solution in fewer number of steps. That's a good observation. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very interesting problem. Recently I saw a paper where they control this step size using PID algorithm. <laughs> right. Like use control to achieve the step size. So find the right step size at, at each point of the branch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How you can tune the step size to make this whole calculation more efficient. So merging ideas from process control <laughs> with ideas from nonlinear dynamics is a good one, but I'm surprised that it would work because the whole, I mean, from I'm not a process control expert. But the whole idea of process control, particularly PID control, is that you somehow have a linear system. So the response is around the linear steady state. You have a steady state, you linearize the model, and then you can expect responses that are kind of linear. So basing, based on the linear model, you can tune your PID control. But this is a highly nonlinear system. So you don't even know when the turning point is, <laughs> right? So how would that algorithm work? in this situation, I don't know. What did they find? Did they actually say that it works? Yeah, they, they say it works. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's an but interesting idea. What is implemented here is also kind of feed forward kind of control. It's a feed forward, like yeah. You yeah. look, if it is converging quickly, increase or decrease your steps. Like well, it's a purely explicit <coughs> method. Okay, we will talk about implicit and implicit met methods later on in the yes. course. It's a purely explicit method because it uses the current experience to project what the future one is. An implicit method will actually anticipate what is going to occur in the future. Okay? And that will have better stability characteristics. This method, when you implement it on ordinary differential equations, is notoriously known to fail. <laughs> it will be called unstable, numerically unstable method. And we will see that later on. Okay? But for this purposes, it works reasonably well. In all there the are no, no explicit methods that are absolutely Exactly. All the explicit methods have stability bounds. And we will see what it means when we look at ordinary differential equations. But the ideas have basically been borrowed from there. Okay. And S is like T with ordinary differential equations in, in some sense. Okay. Any other questions? So the point, yeah, go ahead. So like uh, for the fog back location, if you uh, use that, uh, like you draw square, Use do that method. Can you get three solutions for the half bifurcation? Uh, yeah, for the fork, yeah, you just talk oh, about the pitch fork. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you uh, do, you know, the square, use that uh, form. Can you get uh, three solutions at that point? But, uh, if you use the tangent projection, you are guiding the solution along the tangent vector, uh -huh. so you won't know the other solution. Mm -hmm. So people have looked at, so you monitor your determinant. The determinant change is signed, that means you have a stability change. Okay? So that means around the place where the determinant changes, there is a solution perpendicular to that. So there are actually branch switching algorithms. What ideas do you think they would use? Gram Schmidt orthogonalization type of process. Okay? So I have a tangent vector. So if I give the initial guess along the tangent vector, I have already a good guess for that path. Mm -hmm. So now I want to take a direction that is perpendicular to that in the hope that will be a good guess for the second branch. Okay? So this is how all these ideas come together and you can exploit them. So you, you basically understand how to take a vector 
in a direction perpendicular to the original one. We have seen that in Gram Schmidt, we have seen that in the uh, conjugate gradient method, for example. Right? The same idea can be applied here, and there are papers devoted to branch switching and explaining uh, and applying it on, sorry, very difficult uh, problems. Okay? So that's a good point, good observation. When you have a pitchfork, can you switch? And there are ideas in there. And the whole course can be given on this, but we need to move on to other things. So I'm just introducing the basic ideas, and then we will continue on to the other thing. So the important part, as I said, was uh, to understand this idea of an extended <coughs> system, okay, to achieve a different purpose. In this case, the purpose is to turn around. Okay. The next question that we want to answer is, I want to calculate exactly where that limit point is to as many precisions as I want, 16 digits or whatever. Can I do that? Okay. If you, all the tools that you have are the ones that you have seen, how would you do that? You have arc length continuation, you have Euler Newton continuation, and the problem that I pose to you is find the value of Q to seven <coughs> significant digits where the turning point is. What would happen in the scheme that we have done so far would be if I blow this up, I might have one solution here, I might have the next solution there. Okay? So I'm not going to know exactly where that is to very large precision. So how can I achieve that to a very large precision? I can monitor my dqds, okay? Because q was increasing, all of a sudden q will start decreasing, okay? So if q changes sign between these two points, I could invoke bisection method. What does the bisection method say? I want to find out where it is zero, right? So I'm going to go back and take half the interval, keep repeating that on that, and that may give me one, one approach if I have to, yeah. Couldn't you also just take the second derivative and set it equal to zero and solve that? Now, now you are talking, okay. <laughs> That's a higher level of a, a problem that you can impose. Not quite second derivative, but something that we know must be satisfied at that point. Will the second derivative be zero? I don't know. If it is an inflection point, it might be the zero. Well, second derivative is yeah. zero. Oh, okay. It is not an inflection point. It's not an inflection point, okay? When would you have an inflection point? <coughs> when you have something like, oops. <laughs> when you have something like this, for certain value of another parameter in the problem, T, the T, T star, the coolant water temperature. Now you change the coolant water temperature, and these two limit points start coming closer and closer to each other, okay? So the curve becomes maybe like this, and maybe like that. That would be an inflection point where the two limit points merge at one, uh, one, one to one point. Okay, that may be a point that we want to calculate also. That would be what we call as a cusp point, cusp catastrophe. It's a higher order singularity, and <coughs> we saw that in the bending problem, Benjamin's bending problem. Okay, so the, when you have something like this, it is called a simple limit point, and mathematicians, of course, immediately define what a simple limit point is. A simple limit point is one where you have exactly one eigenvalue that goes to zero, okay? And so now, because of the stability changes around that, okay, it goes from negative to positive, so it has to go <coughs> to zero. So at the limit point, the limit, the eigenvalue will be zero. So can I impose that as an con additional condition on the set of equations and then make Q again a variable and ask the question, where does the determinant go to zero as I change Q? So I'm searching for Q now and asking the question. This is like as checking bise with bisection method, but bisection method is highly inefficient. So we can now post this as a Newton method in an extended system. So this idea of an extended system is very important. And for every one of these higher order singular points, there is an extended system. People have developed that. But for the simple limit point, <coughs> <coughs> We have this equation, again, I'm going to exp uh, express it in abstract terms first. So you have a set of equations. In your case, it may be 160 equations, the Bradu problem, okay? So x is the vector matching with the length of f, as many functions as there are unknowns. And q is a distinguished parameter. And with respect to q, there is a limit point, okay? So there are n equations in here. 
in our particular example, there are two equations. <coughs> <coughs> and the general eigenvalue problem is j times phi equals lambda times phi. j is the Jacobian of that particular function f, n by n matrix. Phi is the eigenvector, right? And lambda is the eigenvalue. So that is the eigenvalue problem. And it is the sign of these eigenvalues that determine the stability, etc. But there are n eigenvalues, but I am interested in only that which is 0. So I am going to set that equal to 0. And I am going to add a set of equations, j phi equal to 0. So once again, I get n equations from here. <coughs> okay, I know the j. I can calculate what the Jacobian is. But phi is my null eigenvector. That is the eigenvector <coughs> that corresponds to the zero eigenvalue. It is itself not zero. The vector itself is not zero. Just the eigenvector it corresponds to the zero eigenvalue. Okay. <coughs> I, do I know that? I don't. I need to calculate that as part of the solution. Okay. But how many equations do I have and how many unknowns do I have? I have n in the first set. I have n in the second set. I have two n equations. And I have two n plus one variables. What are the two n plus one variables? The vector x, the vector phi, each n, that gives me two n, and then the q, which gives me two n plus one. Okay? So I need one more variable, one more equation. What would that equation be? Now, one way of satisfying the second set of <coughs> equations is to put phi equal to zero. That will satisfy it, right? But we don't want phi equal to 0. Why don't we want phi equal to 0? Because we want j to be equal to 0. We want the determinant of j to be equal to 0, right? So how would I impose that phi is not equal to 0? I just can put a constraint. Some function of phi is equal to 1. You can pick any element of phi and set that equal to 1, OK? So this is called an extended system for a simple limit point calculation. Okay. It, is val it, it is valid only at those points because this equation will not be valid at any other point. Okay. That the second set of equations is valid only at the limit point. So get getting a good initial guess for this is going to be a challenge right? because you don't know what the, uh, you cannot give any vector in the x uh, state space, a and t, for example, in this case. Any questions on that idea? <coughs> I'm going to talk only about limit point because there are a lot of others, <coughs> very similar extended systems. But once you get the notion of extended systems, you can open up any paper and uh, read those uh, extra conditions that are appropriate for each type of singularity, like a cusp, for example. Yeah? When you're setting the condition on phi, what exactly is the condition? I'm going to show you because we're going to solve this again with MATLAB so that you see how you take this concept and apply it specifically for this particular problem and implement it in MATLAB. So I'm taking you through the whole stages so you will see. I'm not sure whether I can do it today. <laughs> we also show it in Thompson. I use this to calculate limit points using this. Model. Have you already done it? Yes. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to extend a vector x which is going to consist of the original vector x, the origin, the null vector 5 and then q. <coughs> It'll be of length 2n plus 1. In our example, it will be what? 5. Two equation in, in my example. In your example, it may be much, much larger. Because in one problem, I'm asking you to solve using <coughs> a grid size of 20, 40, 80, 160, or something like that. Okay. <coughs> So the size can very quickly get out of control in inverting a very large matrix. But for our problem, it's not bad. I have original <coughs> two equations. So eventually, I will have five equations for this extended system. So that is my vector. Okay? <coughs> and the specific equations are, uh, for this one, I'm going to use phi 1 square plus phi 2 square minus 1 equal to 0. That is my fifth equation, F5. Okay? <coughs> F1 and F2 are already given to us. F1 equals, F2 equals. I'm not going to rewrite them here. Okay? 
how would F3 and F4 look like? F3 will be J11 phi 1 plus J12 phi 2 equal to 0. That is the vector matrix product <coughs> of J5, okay, the first equation. And then F4 would be J21 <coughs> phi 1 plus J22 phi 2 equal to 0. <coughs> so you have all the five equations I have written down. Not written down, I want to have to explicitly, but you know what it is, okay. F3 I have written down explicitly, F4 I have written down explicitly, F5 I have written down explicitly, right. So applying Newton method on this extended systems is not conceptually very difficult, okay. So how will the Newton method look like? This vector at n plus 1 iteration is <coughs> that vector at the nth iteration minus <coughs> j script j inverse f okay so this is the extended set of functions five functions that i have just identified so i need to write a matlab file to calculate all these five functions and j inverse is a five by five matrix which is the jacobian of all these five functions <coughs> how will the jacobian look like <coughs> i'm basically telling you the thought process that goes in my mind when i write this program okay once I come to this stage, I need to figure out how would J look like and uh, <coughs> I'm going to break this up into block, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Similarly, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. What would go in block 1? Derivative of function 1 with respect to A and then derivative of function with respect to t, okay. So that I already know, CSTRJ I already wrote, okay. That is my <coughs> normal Jacobian I have calculated for the 2 by 2 system. So I just have to insert that into the particular block. What would the next block have been? DF1 with respect to D? Phi 1. Phi one. Does phi 1 appear in the first equation? No, right. So once you figure that out, what will all these be? 0, 0, 0, okay. <coughs> what will the last one contain? DF, DF. DF, a, DQ and DT, DQ. Q is the unknown, the fifth unknown, right? right. But I already know that, right? So D, D, A, DQ and, sorry, DF1, DF1 and DF2, <coughs> I have already calculated that also, okay. So all the work is already done. I just need to make the appropriate calls to those functions and put them in the right place <coughs> in un constructing the 5 by 5 matrix. What would the next block be? That uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, this block. DF3 with respect to D, DA. DF3 with respect to DT. DF4 with respect to DA, DF4 with respect to DT. That is additional work. You need to go back and take the derivative of <coughs> the third function, which what is DF3? If you go and look at DF3, where would in DF3 <coughs> DA, where would A appear? Jacobian J11. So you need to take J11 and look at where A appears and take its derivative, okay. So each one of these you need to do that. So that is a lot of work because it's a highly nonlinear problem and you're taking the derivative with respect to T, it gets pretty messy. And uh, if there is time today, I will show you. <coughs> and what would go in the center block here? D of 3, D phi 1, which is just J11. D of 3, D phi 2, which is just J12, right? It's the normal J that goes in, in that position. The 2 by 2 matrix, we would just insert that, okay? <coughs> and what goes in the last? D of 3 with respect to DQ and D of, three, uh, D of 4 with respect to DQ. So you need to examine once again J11, J12, see whether there are any Qs in there. If there are, you need to take their derivatives. 
Okay, so df3 with respect to dq, df4 with respect to dq. What about the fifth equation? df5 with respect to da? 0. df5 with respect to dt? 0. <coughs> df5 with respect to dq? The last one? Also 0. And here, if I defined it as phi 1 square plus phi 2 square minus 1, it is simply 2 phi 1, 2 phi 2. That's it. So that is your phi by phi matrix. <coughs> so you have the function, you have the Jacobian, make a call to the Newton method, give it a good initial guess, and it will precisely tell you where the solution is. So let me just run that by. <coughs> late class 9 I guess so I didn't actually I thought I did <coughs> okay I, I have not entered it so maybe let's just enter it as <coughs> So what would I need to do? I have shown you, or I have not shown you the two functions, right? I wanted to show you that. C S T R F limit point. <coughs> so again, cut and paste. So C S T R F, I copied it, and I re renamed it as lim, but I didn't rename it here. That doesn't matter because that's just that the function file name is more important than this. Okay. And then I just copied all the variables <coughs> okay. and I changed it to capital X. Capital X is the extended vector. It has five uh, elements of five sizes. So X1 goes to A, X2 goes to T, X3 goes to P1, X4 goes to P2, and X5 goes to Q. And then the first two functions are exactly the same, f1, f2. And what am I doing in line 19? <coughs> I'm calculating my Jacobian. Because what are equations 3? Three? 3 is j1, 1, phi 1 plus j1, 2, phi 2. Right? So I need the j. So I make a call to the Jacobian, the normal Jacobian calculation, 2 by 2. And then I calculate f3, 4. I'm using MATLAB efficiently so that I do both of them at the same time, both functions 3 and 4 are calculated by simple this matrix product, J times phi 1, phi 2. So capital X, third and fourth position contains phi 1 and phi 2. Okay. So I'm calculating in line 20, <coughs> 3 and 4, line 21 is my fifth function. Okay. So I have five functions. At this point, maybe I should show you before I show, uh, we are almost out of time. Let me just take one minute and show you <coughs> how I would use without writing the Jacobian. Writing the Jacobian is going to be a bit messy because you need to find all the derivatives of the Jacobian terms. Okay? You need to figure that out. Uh, but you can use another function in MATLAB which is called f solve, which solves any nonlinear algebraic equations. Okay? So I can make a call to f solve and pass it this particular function, C S T R F limit. Did I type it? <laughs> CSTR F limit. And I need to give it a guess. What would be the guess? Let me just try 0 0.005, 320, oh, 320. Oh, let me make it as a column vector. So those are the first two guesses. And for third and fourth one, I don't know what the uh, null eigenvectors are going to be, so I'm just going to go 0 and 1. For the fifth one, I have some idea of where it turned, right? So was it 10? 9.5, so 9.8, something like this. And let me see whether it works. 
<coughs> so it says that is the solution 7.515 okay and do I have the figure still so it has converged to this one how do I check whether that solution is correct can you come up with a way to make sure that this is correct of course you can take the solution and pass it to CSTR uh, right, typing CSTR F limit and okay those four five functions are satisfied by epsilon the residual is 10 to the minus 13 so the, that set satisfies those five functions but what happens if I had an error in the five function can I make sure really it is the limit point how do I make sure that it is a limit point find the eigenvalues right take those two vectors and pass it to your CSTRJ and calculate the determinant of the Jacobian see how close it is to zero okay and that will show you whether you re really have no errors in your function or the Jacobian so I have uploaded all of them so look at them um, uh, and maybe when I come back if you still need help with this I will go through the rest of the code uh, to show you but I think you get the idea now right how many of you are totally lost <laughs> you are laughing <laughs> this is really advanced stuff so yeah, I'm, I'm really challenging you but I think I'm taking you through more help for a graduate level course <laughs> okay and uh, hope to minimize the pain <laughs> when you're doing your assignment okay so see you on next Wednesday but Nunal will give the Monday lecture taking you through ComSol implementing a lot of these in ComSol okay good luck <coughs> Okay, how are you guys doing online?